Services Secretary of State Destiner in his capacity and others. Is the appellant ready to proceed? May it please the court, my name is Talbot Dallenberg. I'm here representing Jim Apthorpe, the appellant, and I request four minutes for rebuttal. Uh, the Florida people adopted the Sunshine Amendment in 1976. It requires full and public disclosure of financial interests of constitutional officers and candidates for constitutional office. Our argument today really is centered on the language and the structure of the Sunshine Amendment, Article 2, Section 8, and we particularly rely on the decision of the Florida Supreme Court in 1979, uh, which is the first case that the Florida Supreme Court construed the Sunshine Amendment. And in that case, a plant versus Smathers, the court told us how we should look at that amendment and how we should construe it. And it told us to use our common sense told us to look at what the evil was to be corrected through the amendment and, and to uh, th think about the things that would be accomplished if the amendment were adopted. And so we rely on that history and the language of the, uh, of the amendment itself. The court tells us what that amendment was supposed to do. And it says, quote, their expressed desire, that is the people, expressed desire to be informed as to the personal finances of those they will be voting to put in office. Since they felt that, armed with this knowledge, they, the people, will be able to discern the interest on which a public official likely will be responsive. So as we look at the Sunshine Amendment, we understand why the Supreme Court in 1979 referred to the right of the people to get this information. Because the Sunshine Amendment itself starts off with the words that a public office is a public trust. So a public officer is going to be a public trustee, a trustee of the public interest. And uh, it goes on to say that in order to obtain this, uh, this and to vindicate this right, there should be full and public financial disclosure of all constitutional officers. Now other uh, officials may be added by statute, and we see that as we look at the structure of the Sunshine Amendment, we see that later uh, the, the, uh, the drafters of the Sunshine Amendment treat that very possibility. Uh, and so as we look at the amendment itself, we see subsection A of the, of the Sunshine Amendment, uh, 8A in the Constitution of, of Article 2, Section 8, and it says uh, that we'll have full and public uh, financial disclosure of constitutional officers and candidates for that, those offices. Can you talk to us about what full and public disclosure means? As I understand the blind trust statute, uh, what is reported, um, the people know just exactly what the officer would know. That is what goes in to the blind trust and the blind trust gets reported. Um, and your argument is that that is not full and public disclosure. That's right, Can you Your Honor. Talk your Honor, about the definition. What is actually, your question disclosure? fits right in with where I'd hope to go anyhow. And I, I wanted to go and, and say that, uh, that, that Article one, uh, Article uh, 2, Section 8A tells us we have full and public financial disclosure, but does not leave it at that. There are a number of provisions uh, in the Sunshine Amendment that are not explained, but the Sunshine Amendment explains it to us. It tells us in subsection I, the schedule, it tells us what full and public disclosure is. And that, that's where we find the, 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 our content for what full and public disclosure is. It, it's provided in the document itself. And, and look at the way it's structured. It's, it's structured in a way that uh, subsection I, the provisions that uh, say uh, that this will be the uh, full and public disclosure, uh, and it comes following subsection B, uh, subsection H. And subsection H says that uh, the Sunshine Amendment shall not be construed to limit disclosure established by law. Well, is subsection I in the schedule adopted in the Constitution itself, does that establish by law disclosure? It clearly does. Uh, the plain words of subsection H say it's full and public disclosure, and subsection I tells us what full and public disclosure is, and subsection H says if it's been established by law, 
Oh, it should not, it should not be limited. Subsection I, you're right, does define um, full and public disclosure. It seems to do so on an interim basis because it says until changed by law. So That's it right. seems to empower the legislature to speak in to Section I. Yes, Your Honor, and if we didn't have this history and didn't have the decisions by the courts construing uh, the Sunshine Amendment, we might be led to say, well, the legislature has all the power in the world to change it. But look, if the drafters have wanted to give the legislature all the power to, to change it, why do they even put in subsection I? Why do they put subsection H? As you look at the argument being made by my brother, um, uh, it, it sounds really quite rational. It's the argument that you just articulated. But look at it. Subsection I is worthless. Subsection H has no meaning as soon as you accept his argument. What we've got in the drafters here is a provision that provide, it tells us what full and public disclosure is, and, and that uh, definition provided in subsection I, the schedule, is now protected by, by subsection H. And, and going back to my plant case in 1979, the Florida Supreme Court, in referring to what the people were, were looking for, referred both to subsection A, full and public disclosure, and to subsection H, which protects full and public disclosure. So uh, look, at, look at the history again, Your Honor. Uh, we had this period of time, which we've talked about quite a lot in our briefs, both of our briefs. We have, in 1972, the Watergate break-in. Uh, that same year, Governor Askew uh, organized a committee of uh, two co-chairs, a Democrat and a Republican from Palm Beach, uh, and they began to work on ethics issues and on public disclosure. And through that whole period of time, up until 1975, Governor Eskew did his very best to accomplish full and public disclosure through the legislature. If you read through the journals of the of legislature, you're going to find the darndest uh, uh, arguments going on, uh, suggestions being made of, of every kind, but ultimately in 1975 uh, it was decided that the legislature was not going to do anything to achieve full and public disclosure, and so the Sunshine Amendment was drafted and submitted to the people, and people approved it in 1976. Now, uh, as you look at this language, saying the legislature has the power, remember, first of all, in order to really get full ethics reform, you want to have the legislature uh, taking further action. We see that in subsection A. Subsection A tells us that constitutional officers will have to disclose, and candidates for those offices will have to disclose. And there be, may be other requirements provided by law, and subsection A tells us that. And I guess that what, what strikes me here is how often by law is used. Um, in A, defining the parameters of who's ap applicable by law, in C and D, talking about penalties by law. In E, talking about restrictions by law. Right. In G, by law. In H, by law. In I, by law. So oh, yes, there's all this empowerment Honor, going on. And the nice thing is we actually have some construction of, of some of those other provisions. And they're not self-executing. The thing that's self-executing is subsection A, full and public disclosure. And it's self-executing because the drafters provided us with a definition in subsection I, and then included something I don't think you're going to find any place else in the Florida Constitution. It says that, that, that this provisions relating to disclosure shall not be limited. Now, when you see provided by law in other places in the Constitution, I don't think you're ever going to find anything saying uh, what the construction can be. And again, look closely at subsection H. It says uh, it shall not be limited. It shall not limit disclosures established by law. Well, subsection I is law. It's law provided to us by the Constitution itself. So w what the drafters have done, if, if given us good plain words, it has to be full and public, but they then explain those words in subsection I, and subsection H then provides a protection uh, to make sure that we don't diminish that. And look at the, again at the history. Uh, there have been a battle going on for some years about full and public disclosure. Uh, the governor and 
the uh, committee that he worked with, bi bipartisan group, had done their best to achieve full and public financial disclosure acting through the legislature. They failed. They then took on the very difficult task of trying to get a constitutional amendment done by initiative. It had never been done before in Florida. And so taking this on itself was a major step. Accomplishing it was really quite an important step. And Council, they went through we this whole exercise in a way to make sure that they achieved at the end of the day full and public disclosure that uh, it would not be less than that provided in subsection I. So it's our submission that the uh, language of the Constitution itself, the uh, uh, provisions of uh, the uh, decisions by the courts that protect uh, the, this uh, language of full and public disclosure, uh, indicate that we may not have a blind trust which conceals, not reveals, what the financial interests are of a public official. Yeah. Counsel, if you could address the standing issue that's been raised by the Attorney General in this case. Uh, you know, here, we, we um, at this point, there is no candidate using a blind trust in a disclosure, correct? I'm sorry, there, there is no candidate using a blind um, trust in disclosure at this point, correct? I, 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 not at this time, Your Honor. At the time the suit was filed, there was. So, uh, the, so what is exactly the, the actual case or controversy that you're asking this court to decide? Because it seems to me that you're asking us to issue an advisory opinion with regard to the constitutionality of this statute. Your Honor, I see that um, I'm in my room. Counsel, I'm going to give you an additional five minutes All for right. this case. I'm going to grant an additional five minutes to the appellee. You're not required to use it. Uh, either side, but uh, I, I think obviously it merits uh, additional time. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, Your Honor, um, I go back to the Constitution. Um, the Constitution says that people have a right to have full and public disclosure. The legislature now has adopted a statute. It was adopted, I think, in, 19, in 2013. Uh, the challenge made uh, by Mr. Apthorpe was the uh, challenge just before the election following the adoption of the statute, uh, and uh, and it is a challenge to vindicate the right of the people to get the information which were promised to them when the Sunshine Amendment was adopted. But again, how is this case ripe? I mean, there there is no candidate using the blind trust at this moment. So given that, how is this court to determine the constitutionality of the statute as applied? Your Honor, uh, uh, this court and many other courts, certainly Florida Supreme Court, have repeatedly said that where you have uh, a challenge and you have uh, uh, you, you have a constitutional principle uh, that uh, is capable of repetition, we know it's been used in the past. Uh, there is a, a, a very real chance that it'll be used in the future. At that point, you you get to challenge, and you challenge through a declaratory judgment action, uh, and you declare you use the declaratory judgment action, and because. Uh, that's the way we resolve these questions uh, before we have to have injury. We don't have to have injury before we bring that. And we know that by reading uh, certainly uh, Olive versus Moss by the uh, Florida Supreme Court and several opinions by this court. So uh, uh, it's a constitutional challenge. It's a case that seeks to vindicate the people's rights to have a full and public disclosure. And uh, we, we submit that... Uh, it's appropriate for the court to, to take this up. And your argument is that the legislature has no power to enact any kind of blind trust, right? Because at the end of your brief, you, you, um, the reply brief, as I recall, you talk about the, the flaws in the blind trust. You didn't concede that you, any kind of blind trust would merit or would meet the constitutional standard. That's right, John. So your argument is... It really, this one doesn't, and, and it's not your burden to decide to define what would? Your Honor, I, I, I have not been able to conceive of anything, uh, any statute which says the public may not see it. I can't see that you can square that with the language of full and public disclosure. Now, uh, we don't challenge the whole blind trust statute. Uh, candidates are really uh, quite welcome to use the blind trust. We've seen some history in Florida with the use of, tr of, of, of trust. Uh, when uh, Governor Bush was governor, uh, he had a trust. It wasn't a blind trust. It was a trust, and he put 
assets in the trust. He gave authority to, to trustees to, uh, to invest in trust, but he, he gave full disclosure. And indeed, if I read the papers correctly, he continues to do full disclosure, uh, even as he thinks about running for another office. So full and, and public disclosure is a good public policy and it's a good political policy. And so uh, I, I cannot conceive of how a blind trust now is open to the public. Now, uh, by its very terms, this statute says uh, that, a tr that a blind trust may be used in lieu of full and public financial disclosure, and all you have to disclose is the, uh, is the income from the blind trust, and you do not have to disclose secondary sources of income. Now, let's go back and look at subsection I again. It says that you shall uh, uh, provide secondary sources of income. Yeah, I was interested in that. Does that mean that somebody who would own a conglomerate, say a, a share, if you're rich enough to own a share of Berkshire Hathaway stock, right. would you have to disclose underlying that you own Geico Insurance, that you own railroads, that you own a piece of Coke, that you own a piece of American Express? I mean, is I, your... I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't think so, Your Honor. In a, that's a very good point. Um, the Ethics Commission has issued some opinions about uh, how far you have to disclose. I mean, a companion question is, what do I have to disclose as a member of a law firm? Do I have to disclose the, uh, the, uh, uh, the clients that provide uh, uh, fees to my law firm? And but it would seem that if, if the argument is fair and public disclosure includes sort of secondary sources, that it could be an issue to just report that you own a mutual fund or Your Honor, a share of I, I, I agree that this can be an issue. It could be addressed in some other cases, but um, at, at least the Constitution now tells us that we will reveal secondary sources. There may be ethical questions, uh, and there we have to address the question of whether ethical questions are going to trump constitutional principles. So. Uh, I see I'm into rebuttal time again. But uh, I, I think it's a, a really interesting discussion. But I don't think we have to reach it in this case because we now have a very explicit uh, statement in the statute that contradicts what's in the Constitution. And the Constitution provision is protected by subsection H. And, Counsel, um, one more question on the standing issue. Uh, with regard to your argument that this issue is capable of repetition yet evading review, hasn't, this, hasn't a blind trust, in fact, been used by a candidate in recent years? It, it's been, been used. Uh, the device was attempted, I think, originally. Uh, we found that, I think, Gerald Lewis attempted to use it. And the, uh, the Commission of Ethics turned that down, saying it had to be authorized by a statute. Uh, uh, I think Alex Sink uh, attempted to use it. Um, Were there um, challenges filed in those cases? It, uh, uh, we did not challenge. Uh, looking back on it historically, if we'd been wide awake, we probably would have challenged. But, um, uh, that, uh, but we didn't have any statute to challenge at that time. We did not have a statute until 2013, and the, the challenge here was filed at the first election following, just before the first election following the adoption of the statute. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, and may it please the court. I'm Alan Windsor on behalf of the Secretary of State. This case began as an emergency mandamus petition in the Florida Supreme Court. And at that time, the objective was to alter the election or to, to change who qualified for the election and to restrict the secretary's ability to put people on a statewide ballot. It was now transferred back to the circuit court, and now we're here, and we're, we're, there's no mandamus claim anymore. We're left with just a declaratory judgment request, and there is no standing for the appellant to bring that. Uh, this is just an abstract issue. It's just a question of whether the, the statute is constitutional or not, with no practical application for it whatsoever. It is uh, an effort to seek an advisory opinion, which the court has said over and over again, uh, it's without jurisdiction to, uh, to issue. So that's one basis to affirm. Uh, the other basis to affirm would be that the, uh, that the statute is, in fact, constitutional. And we turn to your question about, well, what does full disclosure mean in the context of a subsidiary uh, uh, derivative? If you just look at full and public disclosure, that question is, is very debatable. What does it mean? Well, the Constitution tells us what it means. It, puts, uh, it says it, what it shall mean 
until altered by law. And by law, of course, does not mean what's in the Constitution. It means by an act of the legislature. And so the Constitution gives the legislature authority to determine what is and what is not full and public disclosure. Now, what Provision I does is it acts as a gap filler because when the, uh, when the framers of this amendment wanted it to go into effect right away. And so they said until the legislature acts, this is what full and public disclosure will mean and it lists in, in great detail what it shall mean. But the legislature was never meant to be excluded from this process. Uh, it was meant to be there to fill in the gaps. And that's exactly what the Williams versus Smith case says. It goes into great detail about uh, what, the, what the founders or what the framers of the amendment intended. And that is that the amendment would, would have a broad, um, put the broad framework in place, but leave it to the legislature to fill in the gaps. But I think your friend is making the argument that H would say that H gives the legislature the freedom to make it stricter, but doesn't have any freedom to make it weaker. Yeah, that's, that's the argument, but if you look at the words of subsection H, that's not what it says at all. It says that this provision shall not be interpreted to restrict the ability of the legislature to make additional uh, prohibitions or to make additional ethics reforms. So, and the legislature has done that over and over again. For example, there's employment restrictions, other conflict rules. And if someone wants to challenge one of those rules and come in and say, no, 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 the Sunshine Amendment, that is, that is the beginning and the end of the issue. Uh, you can't go, you can't add on top of that. The Constitution has spoken. This is what the ethics restrictions are. The legislature can't add to those. That argument would be defeated by subsection H. There's nothing in subsection H that would suggest that <coughs> the legislature can't uh, change what full, in, full disclosure means or anything else. It it's it's, gives authority to the legislature. It doesn't take authority away from the legislature. And that's what, that's what the words of the, of the is there, was there anything in the, uh, I know this went out on cross dispositive motions below, was there anything put in the record as to whether having a blind trust statute actually makes, actually is a stricter provision versus a watered down provision? Because, you know, just thinking through it, it, it seems that giving an officer the ability to know, to, to know and, and obligating them to report is actually empowering them for more for more mischief than forcing them or incentivizing them to put all of their assets into a, into a trust that they can't control or that they can have no knowledge of what its contents are. Um, is there anything in the, in the record below sort of establishing that this is a weaker no, way to, to do things? There, there, there was some debate below about the utility of the blind trust and whether it's a good thing as a policy matter or whether it's a bad thing as a policy matter. And of course, for constitutional purposes, the, the issue is whether the legislature was authorized to do it, not whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. Um, but certainly, there are, there, our position is it is fully consistent with the overall purpose of the Sunshine Amendment, which was to enhance trust in government, enhance trust in public officials by ensuring that people don't uh, enrich themselves through their public office. And so uh, conflict of interest is a big piece of that. And that's the purpose of the disclosure requirement is to make sure that the public understands who has conflicts of interest and who doesn't so that they can uh, make appropriate determinations. Uh, and so when you have a blind trust statute, uh, like many other states do, like the federal government does, it allows people to put their assets uh, outside of their knowledge. They don't know what they have and so they don't have conflicts of interest and so the public can have additional confidence that those people aren't making decisions in their official life uh, that will uh, benefit them financially. That's the purpose of it. Now, there are some people who believe that, that it doesn't work, that it's not a good idea, uh, but that's not the issue here. And uh, to answer your question, is there any uh, evidence in the record below? There's not. There's, there's legal argument and there's some citations to articles and people have different opinions about that. Uh, but the question is, uh, can the legislature do that? And the answer is yes, because the Constitution didn't want to get into this level of detail when they adopted the Sunshine Amendment. They didn't want to try and answer every nuanced question, well, what is the threshold going to be for this, or, or what, does, what are secondary sources going to mean in this context? Uh, and so they left that to the legislature. And th there's been some suggestion below and, and here that that's, that was not a good thing to do because the whole purpose of the Sunshine Amendment was to, to, to accomplish things that the legislature wasn't willing to do. But like the Supreme Court said in Williams versus Smith, you just have to look at the language of the amendment. And it says, this is what it shall mean unless uh, or until changed by law. And so the legislature was a part of that. And there's 
Williams versus Smith quoted Governor Askew, who was saying those very things, that we have trust in the legislature. We're counting on the legislature to help us with this, with this process. It wasn't that we can't trust the legislature at all, and so we're going to um, restrict their ability to, to do anything. And there are, throughout the Constitution, there are areas where the Constitution has fixed requirements. There are is, uh, areas where the Constitution has requirements and allows changes by law. Uh, and this is, this is one of them. And the whole purpose of subsection I was to ensure that on day one, there was some definition of full and public disclosure. So, um, Back on the standing issue, yes, the argument's been made by <clears throat> your opposing counsel that you were required to file a notice of cross-appeal to preserve that issue. Could you address that briefly? Sure, yes. We were not required to file a notice of cross-appeal because we were not aggrieved by the judgment. Again, this started as a mandamus proceeding. Uh, by the time it wound up in a final judgment below, the only request that the appellant had for the circuit court was please give me a declaration that this constitution, that this statute is unconstitutional. And the trial court appropriately granted full judgment in favor of the Secretary of State. Uh, so that is the issue in front of this court, is was that, the, the judgment is what's in front of this court. Was the judgment that the appellant is not entitled to a declaration that the statute is unconstitutional, was that judgment correct? And it was correct. Now the trial court found there was standing, but had he found no standing, which is our position he should have, uh, it would have been the same result, which would have been a final judgment in favor of the secretary. So we were not aggrieved by the judgment. We didn't have an obligation to appeal. And in fact, had we appealed, uh, the cross appeal would have been dismissed for that very reason. Imagine if uh, Mr. Apthorpe had not appealed. He had decided that he had fought enough uh, and was going to, uh, to stop right there. And we had appealed. Not a cross appeal, just our own affirmative appeal. What would this court have said in that instance? It probably would have said, you won. You got a final judgment in your favor. You don't have authority to appeal. So back to the merits. The um, there is a provision in the Florida Constitution known as the Conformity Amendment regarding search and seizure, where it says um, where the Supreme Court has issued a ruling on search and seizure, the Florida Supreme Court can't grant greater rights uh, in the in that regard. And it seems to me, in a sense, that's what the appellants are arguing here: that this is like a conformity amendment that the uh, people have said, we want full public disclosure, of, essentially, of your assets. Um, and yes, the legislature can provide sort of the, the nuts and bolts of how you get there, but the, the amendment says that the, the people of the electorate has decided you, every candidate for constitutional office has to provide a listing of, of all their assets. Um, what, what would you say to that type of query or analysis? Well, I'd, I'd say two things. One, I would say if that is what the amendment intended, then that's what the amendment would have said. Like you pointed out, there's a, there's a provision where it does say that in, in other contexts in the, in the Fourth Amendment. So they very easily could have said, this is what full and public disclosure means. The legislature may change it uh, in one direction, but it may not change it in the other direction. It could have said that. It could have said the legislature may not change it at all by just, and it wouldn't have even had to say that if it just specified what it was without uh, allowing, because obviously the legislature can't can override. Um, but so that's one one response is that the the they could have said that, and that's what the court said in in Williams versus Smith, which was also about the Sunshine Amendment, but about a different provision dealing with uh, forfeiture of pensions, and the issue was is that self-executing? And the provision said there will be forfeitures when the public official is convicted under certain circumstances as determined by law. And the court said that means, the that means those conditions are up to the legislature. And they said in a footnote that they could have cut the legislature out of that process in the amendment if they had worded it differently. But you have to look at the words. And so there's a lot of discussion about what the history is. And of course, our position is the statute is fully consistent with the history. But you don't even have to look at the history when you've got words as clear as these words. The second thing that I would say is even if you interpreted it as a, as a one-way ratchet, that the legislature uh, can only make things strict, stricter, to Judge Osterhaus's point, this, doesn't, this, isn't a, um, this isn't an easing of full and public disclosure. It's a change. It's, it's but I think the argument on the merits is, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, sure. but I think the argument is, and correct me if I'm wrong, I, I don't have any personal experience in applying trust, but I think the argument is that if a candidate for a constitutional officer, constitutional officer has you know, 20 
extremely valuable assets, stocks, bonds, uh, real estate, whatever. And, and he or she puts them in a trust and they're not required to disclose those 20 assets. They still own those 20 assets, right? Well, in the, in the blind trust, they don't have beneficial interest in the blind trust, which would... Which would and the trustee can change those assets. Correct. Right. But at some point, the owner of that trust, i.e. the beneficial owner, the constitutional officer, gets that money and those assets back, right? At some point... When the blind the, trust is dissolved. I think... They I mean, would get the equipment... It seems to me the gravity of the, uh, of the gravamen of the uh, argument is... You're not disclosing assets that you still own, even though it's only in a beneficial manner. And the, and the electorate has a right to know every asset you own, because at some point you're either going to get those assets back or you're going to get income equivalent. from those. Equivalent. Right. Well, that, that is the argument. And the reason that argument doesn't work is, be, is again, because it gives the uh, legislature the authority to determine what is full and public disclosure. And so you can make those same arguments about anything. The Berkshire Hathaway example is a great one. Uh, well, do you have to disclose that? Do you have to disclose what your family members have? Do you have to disclose on a more regular basis? Even with putting the blind trust statute aside, as it is right now, the full and public disclosure uh, means an annual disclosure. Uh, well, should it mean a weekly disclosure? Should it mean a daily disclosure? W when you start getting into, well, what does full and public disclosure mean uh, at the abstract level, then you, then you have all those questions, and a lot of them are very difficult to answer, sure. which is why the Constitution defined it. On an interim basis. On it, wh why they defined it on an interim basis and allowed for there to be more specific definitions. By the legislature. By the legislature. If they, if they would have just said there shall be full and public disclosure, period, and not, not given the legislature any authority to define that and not define it itself, think how many cases we would have fighting over what is and what isn't full and public disclosure. If you look at a, just a dictionary definition of full, meaning you know unrestrained, there would be a whole body of case law. There would be cases every year about what is and what isn't, what counts and what doesn't count. Counsel, I'd like you to return to the standing sure. argument. Uh, assuming we, we agree that we can reach the standing issue, why shouldn't we agree with opposing counsel that this issue is capable of repetition yet evading review? Well, I don't think it's, one, capable of, I don't think it's subject to evading review. As you pointed out, this issue's been, uh, been out there for a number of years, uh, and you had an emergency petition filed in this case when, when someone, someone did it. But I think that uh, that's a the capable of repetition yet evading review doctrine is an exception to mootness, and I wouldn't even describe this case as moot because I don't think there was ever standing uh, to start with. Um, but certainly, if someone is going to take advantage of the statute at some point, uh, then we'd have a different circumstance than we have right here. But I'm not aware of any case where there's a statute out there that no one is taking advantage of, no one is using, uh, and the court has said, well, we'll, we'll find that under capable of repetition yet, yet evading review. I mean, that would really then apply to, that would basically undermine the entire um, uh, Martinez versus Scanlon line of cases saying you have to have a bona fide practical real need for the, uh, for the declaration. Back to you, the mayor. Oh, go ahead. Uh, you also argue in your brief that the Secretary of, de um, of State is not the proper defendant. Who is a proper defendant in this case? Well, that, that, again, that depends on what the relief is. Uh, in this case, right now, he's just seeking a declaration in the abstract that the statute is unconstitutional. If that's the relief you're seeking, then uh, there is no proper defendant because there, there's no, there, that's not a proper declaration. If you're seeking, and that's why, again, with, the, with these cases, you have to identify the proper defendant based on the relief that you're seeking. So if you're trying to, for example, stop someone from being on the ballot, that would be the qualifying officer, uh, that either the Secretary of State or Supervisor of Elections if it's a local. Uh, if you're trying to, um, and of course this isn't just an elections issue because people file uh, financial disclosures on an annual basis whether they're seeking election or not. So you might look at the uh, Ethics Commission. So it just depends on, you know, it's... So is the, so is the relief, if, if someone files a disclosure with a, um, with a blind trust and, you know, the, the um, appellants here would suggest that's a breach of the public trust, you know, who do they sue, where do they go? Well, again, it depends on the, what, they're, what they're trying to accomplish. They've just and filed a disclosure. Annual disclosure has been filed by a constitutional officer. Well, I don't know. I, I think that the, what this court said in um, uh, Marcus versus State Senate is you, you sue the person responsible for enforcing the statute. And what, what they've argued below is, uh, well, 
we can't think of a good other person, so it must be the Secretary Can of State. Can I get back the, to the merits sure. for a moment? Um, and I'm sorry I'm into the additional five minutes no. I allotted you because I know it's one thing to prepare for a 15-minute argument and another for a 20. But is it your argument, in the abstract at least, that the legislature has the full power to define disclosure in any way that they determine appropriate? Yes, I mean, subject to the ordinary limitations on any legislation so let's about say, rationality or things like let's that. Let's say a governor is, is elected to a four-year term and the legislature, right after the election, says a governor doesn't have to file uh, any assets to be disclosed less than $5 million uh, within one week of his departing office. That, does that, is that constitutional? Well, if the hypothetical is, could, could they do it at such a point that it would effectively uh, – in the disclosure requirements, you know, to say, well, there, there's a threshold that's so high. There might be a, there might be a challenge to that if, they, if because then it's not the purpose of the legislature to define that or the purpose But isn't of, that their argument, that the legislature well, doesn't have that power to adopt a blind trust statute because it contradicts full and public disclosure to, the, to such a grave extent that it actually limits disclosure? That's the argument. No, and, and, and let me let me be clear that I'm not suggesting that there would be a cause of action that. I understand. Instance. I was saying some some of there might be in a different different instance hypothetically. I don't think there is because again the le the Constitution gives the legislature. But I mean, logically speaking, by logically speaking, either the legislature has the full plenary power to define the extent of the disclosure, or it doesn't. Well, and they do, and I'm saying subject to other just <clears throat> typical restrictions on legislative authority about irrational laws and things like that, they do. They they can disclose. They can determine uh, what. Uh, but I mean, then that gets back to the argument your opposing counsel initially made, which is, then what's the point of the amendment? If the legis did the amendment say to the legislature, we think full and public disclosure is a great idea. We want to give you this mechanical kind of power to adjust it. And by the way, if, if you want to pretty much eliminate it, that's okay too. But, you know, we thought it was a good idea to just kind of get the ball rolling. Well, I think they did think it was a good idea to get the ball rolling and put that framework in place. And I think the <clears> suggestion <throat> that they were uh, distrustful of the legislature is uh, contradicted. I'm not, I'm not questioning motives well, or anything like that. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to focus in on the logical corollary or consequence. Does the legislature have the power, in your view, to define disclosure in any manner they determine they that institution determines appropriate. They do. Right. They do. And that's the structure of the amendment. And if the framers intended otherwise, they could have drafted the amendment otherwise. But what Governor Askew said, and this is in the Williams case where he's quoted, he said, we trust the legislature. And I'm paraphrasing, but he said, we're going to put a broad framework in place and we're going to count on the legislature to fill in the details. And that's exactly what has happened in this case. So we would ask the court to affirm either based on the merits or based on the uh, failure of the uh, plaintiff to demonstrate standing. Uh, and we believe for either one of those reasons or both of those reasons, the final judgment of the trial court uh, dismissing all claims against the secretary was correct. Thank you. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you. Rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, I think our uh, rebuttal will be relatively limited, uh, thanks to Your Honor's uh, questions of counsel. If the legislature has all the power uh, that my opponent says it has, it destroys full and public financial disclosure. You simply don't have it. The legislature was on the other side of this debate. It was a legislature that Governor Askew was fighting with throughout this whole period from 1972 up to 1975 when he submitted the Sunshine Amendment to the people. And the whole idea was to protect, was to establish full and public financial disclosure, define it in subsection I, and protect it through subsection H. Now, the incredible thing to me is that... Well, I'm going to ask you a, a question that may not be perceived as potentially okay, advantageous to your side. All right, sir. And that is... Another example in the Constitution is something that uh, where the Constitution requires judicial nominating commissions. Right. And that amendment provided for um, the composition of those commissions to be determined by general law. And, and, Your Honor, and the legislature 
discovered that provision and changed yeah. the composition of those commissions. So isn't it similar to this amendment? Your Honor, uh, I have to uh, claim uh, that I was at fault for the way that uh, the Article 5 I'm provision... Not, I'm not asking if you're at fault for it. it, it, it I'm just it, saying it, that it, also it, says it, by law. But, but you're absolutely right. And, uh, but did the legislature ever, ever, did the Constitution ever tell the legislature it could not diminish anything or lessen anything? And the difference here is in subsection H. Uh, Your it, argument is that amendment is neutral regarding composition. It says here's the composition if it's changed by general law. It's not like this amendment that says we are requiring the legislature to provide full disclosure. It won't be limited, but the legislature can provide the mechanism. Well, yes, Your, uh, Your Honor, and the amendment says the legislature may also apply this to other people, and we, we can see uh, really uh, quite a lot of the detail. And I'm sorry, I gave you an additional five minutes, and I used a lot of your time, but it's expired. I apologize, Your Honor. No, no, that's quite all right. I used it. But I'll, I'll, uh, I'll allow you to briefly conclude. Well, uh, Your Honor, the only, other, only argument in closure is that uh, the response to Judge Rose's uh, question uh, and to Your Honor's question and the response by counsel, the issues of standing were resolved by the trial court. The issue of a proper party was resolved by the trial court. Now, counsel, I am going to have to ask you to, to finish your argument. And, uh, and so we, we think those issues are not properly before the court. Thank, Thank you, you, Governor. Thank you for your arguments, both of you. Thank you. <clears throat> After counsel's had time to uh, clear their tables, uh, we'll move to the third case, State of Florida versus Carpenter. Thank you for your arguments.